Okay, please. Yeah, Dr. Jabir, your uh, comments on IOS versus OCT in this particular. I go with OCT because nowadays uh, we are doing only less of OCT and it is easily interpretable because here what we are interested more is in the lumen, the landing zone, chance of a dissection, the uh, the problems with the circumflex ostium and whether we are put whether our area of where the where the lipid characteristics or the characteristics should be and the edge complication so considering everything together and there is no strong indication for an so this is an area where it is busy. we are not audible and it is more, uh, what do you call it? it is more easily interpretable and uh, you can take three MC and the value. Uh, somebody's phone, somebody's phone is causing interference. Yeah, okay. yeah better. Okay, Dr. Jabir and Dr. Kirti, by the time Sridhar finishes the case, what is your threshold for serum creatinine or EGFR, whichever you are using? And your threshold for hemoglobin in this particular patient, the hemoglobin is 9.5. Okay, so what are your individual preferences for creatinine and uh, renal function and hemoglobin? So, uh, I think I think hemoglobin is a very important issue because uh, anemia is is a is a big uh, precursor to mortality in this group of patients by virtue of either you have a GI bleed or you have a renal dysfunction or you have um, any any re need of a uh, you know transfusion by virtue of a bleeding complication followed by then that causes huge ischemic issues as well. But I, I think your second part was hemoglobin. What is the other thing that you said? The creatinine, creatinine and renal function. Creatinine is uh, the renal function and not the creatinine alone, but the GFR and the cystatin C eGFR has a vital role for us because if we start seeing values of less than 60, then uh, then trying to do, uh, then, then for me, it is a, it is a push towards, uh, push towards IVIS rather than OCT because I don't want to give too much of contrast somehow. Um, but, uh, but I know that people have used various technologies with OCT as well. Uh, but then when you start deviating from, by diluting contrast and using saline as, a, as an OCT medium, then the validation of co coefficient of refraction changes. And so you cannot rely anymore on the sizes that you get in the OCT. And that's very, very important. So the validation for the sizing of the OCT is only been computed when you use contrast in the syringe, uh, in the catheter and contrast outside. Otherwise, there's a refractive error which deviates the sizing considerably. I'm, I'm concerned about the hemoglobin of 9.5 because we are doing a complex procedure with multiple stents. Total stent length is more than 60 with bifurcation. Totally complex where antiplatelet therapy has a crucial role and discontinuation of antiplatelet therapy may be detrimental. So I would like to evaluate this patient prior to the procedure itself to see whether there is any ongoing bleed. If there is no ongoing bleed that is confirmed, then I may, be, may not be too much worried about 9.5 because 10 to 12 may be standard around in our part of the world. But I'm too much concerned about the renal dysfunction because here we are having a lengthy procedure, multiple contrast injections, the total contrast load is likely to be high. Along with three or four OCT runs is another 60 ml of contrast. At least if you are using a, a power injector, we may have to use at least 15 ml for this LED, long LED. So an additional... Uh, for, uh, if the EGFR is too low, what we can use, the maximum recommended is somewhere around 2.5 or 3 times of the EGFR. So that is a big concern. In that case, as Dr. Kirti Punamiya said, uh, 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 IVS may be preferred. But if the EGFR is good, more than 50, then I may not find a big problem with OCT. But I would like to minimize the number of OCT, minimize the contrast injections also. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Now, uh, Kirti, you have anything to say? And Let me just add one more thing. That, uh, oh, Sridhar, did we do our OCT run from the ramus back to the left main at all? Sridhar is mute. Oh, okay, sorry. So my, my concern, see, if, we, if, we have an, if we have opened an imaging technology, then I think we should use it completely. 
and especially in the realm of a left main bifurcation where we are looking at the entire left sided circulation at stake the unlike the other branches in the left coronary artery the circumflex artery is not a branch i mean it, it's not a side branch it is an actually a second main branch so so we need to really image that artery as well and understand it thank you very much better Uh, yeah, I think you want to come. Yeah, yeah, no issue. Yeah, this late. Okay, they are busy yeah. there. Kirti, yeah, and Veer, both one after the other. Uday, what do you think? Uh, what would you? Uh, what was your yeah, opinion the regarding way. these issues? No, regarding the creatinine. I and, think uh, uh, about uh, uh, you know briefly, like you know, what would you use in your practice, OCT or IVIS in this okay. case? And then, if you okay. use an imaging device, would you go and image both pre and both post, both branches pre and post? Hey. Ideally speaking, I would uh, give a first choice to OCT, second choice to IVIS, and you have already mentioned the contraindications to OCT. Okay. It's okay. okay. Besides that. I would seventy percent of my patients of the patient the and most of my patients seventy percent of them undergo either of the imaging. Of course, I take a cut off of about fifty five uh, each GFR for uh, using. Yeah, uh, epigram is okay. Yeah, CT and I. We are going to do a present under the uh, doing a trial. Yes. Angioplasties, PCIs entirely on IVAS, especially if the creatinine or the EGFR is less than 55. And uh, because of the COVID, we have a little bit uh, less volume, but we expect to control, uh, complete our trial by the first week of January, mm -hmm. where uh, we will be publishing our data on only uh, on performing a PCI only on IVAS, and only one injection we do that is at the end of the procedure to document that the stent is well deployed. of course we have got diverse evidence also but for medical legal reasons i think require that uh, as they are progressing with the case kirti and jabir both of you all are you comfortable doing v stenting in this particular situation first or you have any other strategy of stenting first kirti and then dr jabir no for me for to have a v stent it has to be a very voluminous left main which is uh, with very small arteries So if I were to have a six or a five millimeter left main, and I had a two and a half and a three o millimeter stent in the branches that coming and kissing, I'd be okay. But when I have a left main lumen of around three point five, then for me uh, this is not an option. Um, and very simply, there are better techniques to do this angioplasty because um, I, I would rely on crossing over coming into the left main. and not be blinded by two stents coming into the distal left main where there could be a lipid rich plaque with a thin cap uh for me that's important now having said that at this point in time as well it is easy for shridhar to move from a v stent to any of the other technologies by just crushing one of the stents that is a circumflex stent but i think that should be decided by the images and uh, i think the primary operator absolutely absolutely dr jabir uh i also agree with that dr kirti because nowadays we don't prefer doing a v stent unless uh, it's a problem where the patient is crashing we have a hemodynamic compromise and there is no landing proper landing zone beyond uh, 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 you don't have a place for doing a port or something that is limiting you from doing other uh, well a uh, proven uh, techniques like a dk crash or a qlo technique if especially in this patient uh, i would i had it be, uh, if i had considered a left main bifurcation stenting i would have think of a dk crash rather than a v stenting something might have prompted the operator to go for a v stenting that i think we'll get uh, that uh, when uh, we may, uh, dr kasturi may be able to ventilate us regarding why did he preferred a v stenting which is not much a preferred technique nowadays I have no, actually. I have uh, seen. We have not. Uh, we have not extended into the left vein. Just uh, landed at the ostium, and uh, LED dilated because LMC area is seven point eight four mm. I didn't want to extend into the left vein, but because the plaque. This is the absolute beauty of the OCT. OCT showed the definite uh, distal left vein dissection. 
though angiogram is not showing the dissection you can see a clear cut dissection which is more than 60 degree if i leave it definitely it lead to thrombosis so that the reason now i'll show the ct run i have a question for you sir yeah you see there are question from the audience artism yeah kirti yeah. one minute before uh, yeah sure yeah there is a question from the participant that is there any role for focal stenting of the mid led rather than implanting many stents kirti can you answer that i think they are busy in the cath lab there in this case in this case i cannot answer that question but yes in general if you are asking me specifically uh, or just generally and not specifically yes there is a role for spot stenting in diffusely diseased arteries based on ifr and i think uh, a lot of the western world i mean uk primarily from uh, imperial college there's a lot of data which has come on that um, and i guess that is important that is uh, let me show the ocd run let me show the ocd run yeah and uh, this is the ocd run you see distally we will land in a very healthy zone you see the trilaminar structure this is a you can see the internal elastic lamina this is a normal healthy zone only and you see distally vessel size is uh, means uh, stent area is 4.4 as per the criteria 4.5 but the 2.2 go, 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 go forward go back go go forward to the edge go back to the edge yeah edge yeah, this yeah, is yeah, fine yeah, okay now come this back this is so. perfect yeah okay this is fantastic perfect. this is a normal landing zone and area if you see the 4.6 4.5 here some under expansion 3 is there but here 3.4 and 4 3 4 by 5 square mm fragmentally it's a very good size 5 square mm and 6 you see the at large then you see the i am coming to the this is the led ostium but the distally you see a smooth dissection of the left main see that sure, my question to you my question to you yeah when i saw your left main run i almost yeah. imagined that you would be doing this yeah so what why did you not change your strategy based on the oct because that I'm is pressing i'm going with a, like a now i crushed that one and now i put the left main stenting Uh, now you see we are going ahead with the left main stenting and cross it and do the final kissing and that right. will be uh, optimization i'll show this one fantastic yeah, yeah go to this one now this so uh, show the angle the... yeah sir uh, just let me show Dr. the angle sir. yeah tell me sir uh, dr khanolkar here yeah tell me uh, sir have you already stented the left main yeah already stented left main you used a which wire the circumflex wire or you have used the led wire to carry the led wire led too yes. big no led too big yes. area yes. so we have taken 3.5 mm into 18 mm stent and extended up to the ostium you see the next and that oct was prior to prior to the uh, lmc stenting so after that only i took the decision to cover everything and cross it and do the kissing and optimize it go to the next next go to the next Yeah, this is the what is the next distally also because the vessel is big only we wanted to optimize with uh, at least uh, uh, three fourth of the vessel with three mm nc what is the next we uh, did the part also using the four mm nc this is a four mm nc what is the next now this is looking nice what is the next okay, this is the last view yeah you can come in now I, I you know i want to take this comment and say that this is uh, this is this is something that is important and very 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 crucial is that we look at the pre images again and at any point in time if any operator feels that they could do a v stent in a smallish left main when i say smallish left main means anything which is a lumen which is demonstrated as somewhere less than 4 mm that's not a very voluminous left main and to do a effective v stenting without damaging the left main is practically impossible because the balloons extend almost 1 to 1.5 mm and you can never be precise in placement so this was a fear that i had because the left main was not a fibrotic plaque when you start looking at the left main images uh, there is there is a thin cap there is a lot of lipid over there and we I, i almost was fearing that we would dissect the left main and the ostium of the left main uh, the, os, the proximal end of the stent was key to me as i mentioned earlier to you as well yeah no no but it's 12 coding yeah pull back uh plasma led we dilated with 3m and balloon and 
uh, uh, the Taj to discuss, we are doing with Graham and Delinda Architecture. So to do, pull back, pull back, pull back. Delhi, not removed. I am not going to press me, Delhi. Huh? 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 Hello, Kabir. Kabir. Yes. Kabir. By the time yes. they, are, they are working on that, uh, how would you plan now, after the third stand, that is the third stand which is there in the left main, how would you plan your strategy on the circumflex ostium? I didn't get you. I didn't get you, doctor. Now there is a V stand. Yeah. And you have, uh, he has put another third stand, which is going from the LED, uh, from the ostium of the left main into the LED. So there will be some amount of compromise of the circumflex stent, proximally, proximal end of the cell. How will you plan it out there now? What are we going to do at the ostium yeah, of the uh, circumflex proximal? The, the, the uh, easiest thing I'll consider is I'll put a non compliant balloon across the circumflex ostium. I'll try to crush the circumflex stent at the ostium, rewire it, and give a kiss. Okay. That means this will be like a, a reverse crush. Reverse crush technique. Reverse crush. Oh, okay. What about you, uh, Kirti? You are mute. You are unmute yourself. Kirti, unmute yourself. Yeah. This is, in my opinion, it'd be uh, what is a classical crush because the circumflex stents are going to be behind the LED left main stents. But the problem is there is one circumflex stent which has been crushed. Then there is a layer of a LED stent which is on it. And now you put a third layer which is now the left main to LED. That step in the circumflex should have been probably done before this third stent was placed because sometimes an operator could be struggling trying to put a balloon into that circumflex now. And there is going to be three layers of mesh, which we have to cross. And I think that is, uh, that is crucial in this case, because uh, having stented that, if the culprit is just beyond, if you have deformed it, and if you suboptimize the circumflex origin, then you're very close to what was the culprit lesion in this patient. And so uh, that is another issue for me. And, but, uh, but you know, Sridhar is an extremely uh, effective operator. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he pushes a balloon through and is able to get his final kiss and get a great hostile result over okay, there as well. Yeah, I just would be uh, careful not to go under the strut in the circumflex. That's it. The most important challenge is to take the wire through the, from the left main into the circumflex. And uh, OCT prior to rewiring of the circumflex would be important. That will tell us what is happening at the ostium of the circumflex and the la different layers of the stents which we have over there. I completely I would agree in the OCT. This would be a good time to do an OCT to understand the lay of the land. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Let us leave it to him. Yeah, I, absolutely. He's operating there. Can we have yeah, a look yeah. at the screen? The angioscopy yeah, yeah, screen? See that I Actually, hope you're not... I hope you're not disturbing you in. No, no, I'm just I'm comfortable. I really do this type of cases. It is not a reverse cut. It's not a reverse cut. Actually, what we have done. Oh, you have already are, crossed it. No, already what is happening? Stent is into this slightly, not maximum. We have put two, three mm only into the uh, distal left main. It's like a crush only, classic crush only. And this LED just at the ostium. And then we are overtaking that one. I think it's a simple like a crush, but the only thing is one more layer of crust in the LED. And uh, we are very comfortable in crossing yeah. and doing this one. Already we have crossed it. And if you do the optimization by uh, using the leg and kissing, then that would be fine. This is, uh, I don't see any problem like a uh, crusty uh, strength and, and optimize. That's enough. Excellent, okay. Dr. Sridhar. I think you have crossed the first challenge. 
Yeah, yeah. Give one point to Shai Balu, Tajuna. I'll show even uh, kissing and everything, and after that you can come back. Meanwhile, if you have any lecture or anything, you can discuss. But and after know, that, I'll do the OCP ask. No, you are. We couldn't hear you in the interim period. Yeah, this is the advantage of the OCP because you see, distal left nine. Angiography is not showing anything. Angiography is showing absolutely like a normal vessel. Yes. If I am not doing the imaging, definitely I would have thought it is extremely good result. I would have left the patient. But this, uh, as Dr. Punamia said, I did only because the left main plug button is also more. I anticipated distal dissection because we are highlighting this one. We thought of to leave it and uh, I would have gone for a fast, but because the distal left main area was almost very environment because then I very understand we do the uh, left main stenting but uh, because the area only I changed the strategy but because plug button because we get with the plasma is slightly pulled and inflation this called the section and uh, just now cross it and do the altercation that fine because it's a uh, plasma 3.5 mm accommodated and this is 4 mm I think uh, uh, we are comfortable with the result I mean, while any lecture is there, you can continue and I will show the remaining yeah. images. Yeah. So, we will uh, go ahead. I think yeah. the first person to speak expected is Dr. Jabir. Is that right, Dr. Jabir? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Now, all of us know Dr. Jabir. He doesn't require any uh, formal introduction. He's a very senior interventionist at uh, Lisi Memorial Hospital in Kotin. He's got vast experience um, and uh, fellowships, a lot of publications and presentations to his credit. And he's one of the early members uh, to start imaging uh, in our country. Right. So without wasting much time, may I go ahead, uh, Dr. Jabir, can you go ahead with your topic? Uh, thank you, Dr. Kanokar. Can I have a minute? I have some issues with the connection. I'll take two minutes. Or do you want us to go ahead with Kirti then, if he's okay? Ah, then it is okay, then the doctor keeps the up. Uh, fine, it is better not to waste time. Perfect. Okay. Would you uh, like to start? Uh, Kirti, I think you are supposed to speak on OCT in my experience in challenging cases. Yeah. And most of the participants, uh, they know you as one of the senior most uh, uh, interventionists in our country, especially in Bombay, and with varied experience and uh, interest in, in cardiac interventions, coronary, peripheral, as well as structural heart disease, especially with focus to TAMI. And uh, today, I think you will be speaking on uh, your uh, experience in challenging cases. So I hand it over to you. You have 15 minutes, uh, Kirti. Please go ahead. Can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Okay. So I think uh, I'm going to just walk you through uh, just a little bit of an experience that I've had and the things that I've taken in areas where I feel that OCT has scored brilliantly for me, where it has actually changed the way I've looked at those patients and made decisions based on that. I'm going to start with something that we see very often, a 50-year-old gentleman who has a very high family history, strong family history with uh, an LDL cholesterol of around 120. Stress test is negative. But because his parents have had problems, he's in the corridor and he's asking you, oh, you know, now my parents have had this problem. How bad is my risk? And so he gets a CT done and comes to me and his CT shows that he's got a 50% soft plaque in the proximal RCA. He has no symptoms and he has a stress test which is negative. At this time, I mean, we know nothing to be done except lifestyle changes. So we do a lifestyle change. He actually loses 25 kilos and he is absolutely okay with cholesterol medications. One year is good. And that is what a lot of trials are looking at one year and two years and these patients do well. But two years, end of the second year, December, while walking has a massive inferior wall MI, he occludes that RCA comes to us. This is in spite of following nice, nice guidelines, AHA guidelines, and every other guideline for lipid uh, control and risk factor modification. He has done all of them. All of them have been tick boxed and they are normal. Now, this is the RCA we did. This is his LAD. But having seen this happen to uh, one or two of our patients, I think this has actually changed the way we look at these CTs now. So another 45-year-old with a very similar background 
came to us with the normal CT in 2015, developed more symptoms in 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 2000. Uh, in, in a year, late, you know, in 2019, this was he had developed more symptoms. And look at his CT. His CT, which was showing a right, which was absolutely normal, now shows a significant lesion. So we, by research protocol, did a CTFR. And you can see that the CTFR shows a red beyond that narrowing, which is around 0.7 is the FFR. And this is very specific because we published a paper we, uh, uh, one of our fellows published a thesis with an AOC of around 82% correlation with the FFR uh, that we do in the cath lab. So what do we do? In this patient, the angio shows this, but the decision making, uh, the, the, the decision is made, made on this image over here. And this is an important image for me. Uh, you can see that there is a considerable reduction in volume of this artery, the area is narrowed considerably to two millimeters square. And the MLA of the normal segment, just beyond where you can see all the three layers is around 12.8, almost more. Even here, there's, signif there's a significant fibrotic uh, lesion all around and the EL is fairly deep. And so this is a fairly large artery around 4.5 millimeters with a two millimeter, with a one millimeter, almost 1.5 millimeter hole. So. When I see this lipid necrotic lesion with a thin cap, I don't do balloon dilatations anymore. This is a case where we do direct stenting. We don't, because when we start doing balloon dilatations in these patients, we have seen a lot of slow flow happening because of lipid embolization. And also you see a lot of thrombus developing very easily on those lesions. And once you've done a stent, de deployed it, I think you're good. The OCT runs will confirm apposition size and all those things. Those are normal stories. But this image is an impactful image for me. When I see a large voluminous artery with a very large lipid core, for me, this is direct stenting. And this is not because I see zero calcium. I see zero calcium score. So all the images have helped me make a decision and a choice. And that choice is exercisable and it leads to a good result. Now this 50 year old gentleman came with, uh, came with a STEMI in 2014. He's a US resident and is, he underwent an angioplasty to the LED and, uh, and, and the circumflex. Uh, three years later, had a he, had a, he had vague symptoms, rushed to the hospital, enzymes mildly raised. They did a picture and it was a, the LED stent at thrombose. He underwent an angioplasty. Now he was traveling in India, had similar symptoms for two days while he was traveling. So he came to Mumbai with symptoms. We saw him normal enzyme. Uh, echo showed a regional wall motion at that time. We didn't have the data from the US, but this is the angio. And this angio shows that he's got what I thought was an angiographically significant stenosis in that area just after the OM1, just extending just beyond the second OM and, and uh, looked around 70% angiographically in all the views. So we took out our OCT imaging catheter before we did that. And as we image all those lesions prior to, we did an OCT and our OCT show an MLA of 1.99. So this is similar to Kasturi's case right now, where we saw that there's these lesions are less than 1.99 areas of less than one point or less than two, but this is a extremely fibrotic lesion. I don't see any lipid for almost three, you know, around three millimeter, uh, at, at least for 0.5 of a millimeter in the depth. In fact, if you look at it from seven o'clock to 12 o'clock, there is a sheet of calcium. So it's fibrocalcific lesion, but a very stable looking plaque. I don't see lipid necrotic areas and the fibrous cap is thick. So before we rush into it, this is this reference segment before and the reference segment after you can see the calcium extends into the proximal part of the artery, but not into the distal part, which is a very good artery. And he's had previous tense in the proximal circumflex, which is very obvious from those images. I do an FFR, the FFR is 0.96. So this is a story. This is a pattern which we are seeing that you could have a similar lesion, which is lipid necrotic, It'll be FFR positive, but when these lesions become fibrocalcific, they don't remain any flow limiting at all. And in my practice now, I am very comfortable leaving these lesions on medical management. And this is the power of this image that can allow me to do so. Unless, of course, five years later, I learn otherwise. Based on this data, these kind of experiences, 
these images are very powerful and impactful for me in making a decision for my patients. And so we continued medical management and it has been now uh, at least two years and he's doing well, uh, lives in Cleveland and his cardiologist communicates with me. On one of our uh, workshops uh, in, in, in the Southeast uh, countries, uh, uh, we did a rotational atherectomy for what looked like a calcified lesion in that left main. And we used a 1.5 fiber followed by a 1.7 fiber, did an angioplasty and put in a four millimeter stent. And this is what the angiography looked like. The four millimeter stent looked great. But when you look at the IBIS, uh, the OCT image, this is the OCT image before. And this is the OCT image after the stenting. And you can see that the OCT image after the stenting shows that the calcium nodule has not expanded. And that is why you see that shadow even the view afterwards angiographically. So what does this mean? What does this show us? If I have to, I, for me, it is that the current technologies that we use for these lesions of calcified nodules is not enough, is not adequate at all. And why do I say that? Because I've seen similar issues even in other patients. And you can see this IVIS image. IVIS also at various times have shown me calcified nodules with malopause stents around it. And whatever you do, you may deform the stent, you may break the stent if you try to expand it further, but you cannot get to kill that calcium nodule into the wall. And if you try too hard, you can rupture the artery. So what is the problem with this? With this image, if I look at this image, then my assessment of this image is, this is the lesion. And it is important because the orange part shows the calcium, which is right into the lumen. And the, the yellow is the artery. And the black line is the lumen. Now, when you look at this lesion, remember that this is the wire. The wire is at the north end of the lesion. It is very away from this calcified nodule. And even if I have to take a 1.5 or a 1.7 fiber, I could go here. And the wire bias will only allow me to ablate normal tissue and not ablate the calcified nodule at all. And this is a problem with our technology. When you see OCT images like this in a calcified nodule, please do not use a rotational atherectomy because it is not going to help you at all. In this, the only technology I think that will help us is an orbital atherectomy. Now, instead of that wire being at 12 o'clock, if that wire was close to eight o'clock down near the calcified nodule, that would have been a different story by pure apposition to that valve. We could have shown that it, it, it actually uh, opens that area, shivels a little bit of that calcium and does the trick and you can modify it. I don't, I mean, I, we, we've got three or four cases like that, but I mean, I tried to do my slides one hour before this talk, so I've not been able to find those slides and I, I'm gonna let it go. I took this from New York. This is uh, Richard Schofield is, is a great operator from St. Francis Hospital. Uh, with his courtesy, I'm showing one of his lesions where how they have used in calcified nodules, they've used orbital atherectomy, and you can see that the stents have expanded much better, far more predictable the technology. And also, o o orbital atherectomy has shaved it off very well. Instant restenosis. When people have had first generation stents 10 years ago and now 10 years later, they come back with issues and coronary syndromes like this patient on a cipher from 10 years ago in the LED uh, done by a very, very senior and respectable operator. This is his lesion. And it looks like a very critical LED lesion, looks like it is acutely complicated. So we do an IVUS and even though we do multiple runs of IVUS, you can see that the IVUS is because of that lesion, the iris doesn't give us a great image because what it does is in these tight images, the iris, the water, the fluid around the catheter is completely lost. It doesn't allow to rotate very well. And in spite of everything, these iris images are bad. So post-rotational atherectomy, we put in an OCT and these are OCT runs, which from that lesion, and you can see this is the proximal, this is the distal. So you know the proximal landing zone is good. The distal landing zone is okay because there is still a calcified nodule at seven o'clock and we need to avoid it and probably go pro proximal or slightly distal to it. But look at the lesion in between. If you look at the images in between, which are the top four images, starting from the left, you can see fibrous, fibrous cap from seven o'clock to two o'clock, but it is a thin cap from the other side with lipid necrotic area. 
coming close to that, the second image, you can see lipid necrotic area. You don't see calcif calcification. You can see the previous stents all around it. So this is a this is what was a complex plaque that caused the clinical syndrome. You can see the center two images show the same. And then on the right side, you see a very stable plaque with a flat calcified sheet inside the stent and a thick fibrous tissue. So you have a mix of very stable plaques and a very, very complex lipid necrotic plaque in the same plane. And, and these cases do well with a rotational arthrectomy. You need to debulk them. And once you debulk them, they do well. You can expand these stents and they do well. Uh, if you look at this image, this is the image of a well-expanded stent at the end. And now going back to another scenario, a similar situation 10 years later after, uh, and, and this is an image where we, in 2017, this lady came to us. She had a stent in the LED. The stent in the LED was done 10 years ago where she came to us, the culprit lesion was the right, we fixed the right. This was the angio from 2017. This looked like normal, but in the mid segment, you could see the edge of the stent has a little narrowing in the mid segment. We thought we should treat it medically. Now, year later, angina, RCA is patent where we put in a stent, but look at this progression of disease in one year in the proximal LED. It is humongous. This is from almost nothing. It has come to a 90% narrowing. So when you do an OCT in this image, you can see the previous stent edges. When you do an OCT in this, this is an OCT run. And look at the spectrum of images and the information that this OCT has to offer. Now, what is important is if you look at the, if, if you look at the images with the yellow border, those are significant lesions which give you plaque characteristics. But if you look at the ones which are not in the border, which is at 9 o'clock and at 11 o'clock, you can see that there is, this is a classical neointermal neo hyperplasia in a stent, which is covering the stents, not encroaching the lumen much. But then there are sheets of calcium, there's spotty calcium, there's a sheet of calcium, and these are hard lesions, but the lumen is good, and these are stable plaques. When you look at the distal, that is the yellow border right to the left and bottom, you can see that this is the edge of the stent. It's very fibrotic. There's calcium at four o'clock, like a sheet of calcium. And by our current technologies, we would say, oh, there's only a single quadrant of calcium in this artery. So why do a rotablator? Okay. And this is important because this is, if anybody else has any other view on this, look at this image carefully and I'll keep it for a while. But on the others, when you go to the 12 o'clock position, you can see laminated, layered, new intimal hyperplasia, homogeneous inside, a little more fibrotic inside, but this is a layered, homogeneous, new internal hyperplasia, very stable. Coming to the right upper over there is a necrotic plaque with a huge lipid necrotic area, probably the culprit lesion with the dissection from a balloon dilatation and the proximal stable plaque. Now, based on these images, we thought that the proximal lesion could easily be fixed with a, with a balloon angioplasty and stent, which we did. And what do we do with the distal artery? So these are the four images. And that image is a densely fibrotic lesion. But if you look at this image closely, I don't see calcium, which would require a rotational arthritis. But look at the rest of the images. Okay. These are important. So we did an angioplasty. We struggled with the distal lesion because we found it not dilatable at all with most current technologies. And this is from a case a year ago when we didn't have IVL. And we don't use IVL in this indication. And we have not used rotational arthrectomy because of our OCT, but sometimes it can fool us. And especially in the instant restenosis, which comes after many years, even if you don't see calcium on the OCT, believe you me, these are difficult to dilate. It is better to burr it. We had not burred it. And look at, see what happens. The angiography it looks good. And the proximal part looks good with the two layers of stent. Very good. But when you look at the distal part, the distal lesion, in spite of my best efforts in the cat lab for almost an hour and a half, this is a suboptimal result. And I hope that she doesn't come back with a restenosis over there because we'll have to do a rotational arthrectomy at that stage. This is a case that we did in an unstable syndrome in a live case in one of the meetings in the South uh, around two years ago. And we discussed a huge amount on this. Uh, it's a bifurcation lesion close to the proximal LED. And I didn't want to make it a complex lesion because a very large circumflex came around it. So the question was the LED and the ramus and the trifurcation. So in that point, I kind of used a flexome in both LED and the OA, in the ramus, dilated them and took runs of images 
from the LED into the left main and the ramus into the left main. Look at these images for two minutes and then we'll go to the next slide, which I will show you section wise what these images showed me. Now, when I look at these from the left, these are images from the LED back. Image number one is the landing zone. Image number two, you can see a little bit of swirling of contrast of blood there. Image number three, you can see a fibrotic dense lesion in the LED. Image number four, you can see there are two lumens. One is above the catheter, one is below the catheter. That is the ramus coming up in that image. And that is again the same bifurcation with the carina scene. And you can see that there is a severe lesion which is fibrotic in the LED. And when you come into the left main, you can see the ostium of the circumflex, which is right over there to the nine o'clock. And this is your left main, which looks like a very good artery. Now, when you look at the lesions coming back from the ramus, very strong fibrotic plaque, nothing major, stable plaque, which I would say I don't want to touch because either I end up putting a 40 millimeter stent in the ramus as well, which I don't like because I would have complicated it from a single stent to a triple you know, a bi-directional three stents compromising the circumflex ostium as well, possibly. So I thought that I do a cutting balloon on that ostium, get a great result and then leave it alone because the rest of the distal lesion looks fairly stable and with aggressive lipid uh, control, we would be able to treat it well. And so this is what we did. We, 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 this is the ostium. So we put in a stent into the LED, a single stent from the left main to the LED, did a pot, optimized it, did a kissing balloon, put in a drug eluding stent in the ostium of the circum of the ramus and left it at that. And this is a final OCT run from the LED back. And you can see the LED is well dilated and you can see the ostium of the circumflex good. You can see the ostium of the OM, the ramus is looking good and the angiographic picture is looking good. I believe we followed up on phone with this patient, with the operators for around six months, but I believe that the patient's doing well. But this is a live case where we thought we, we did what is simple and what was important to do at that time um, and, uh, and got a great result angiographically. And I thought accepted that angiographic result as a great result with an OCT guidance. Thank you for this listing, but this is a little of my experience that I shared where OCT made differences in our decision and be stuck by those images to kind of make a change in our practice. Thank you. Thank you, Kirti, for your excellent presentation as usual. And uh, we have learned a lot from your presentation today and uh, the participants also uh, must have learned quite a lot from this presentation. I've got one question for you. You demonstrated one vessel on OC, uh, where there is a eccentric calcification, you did not want to do a rotablator in that patient because even a 175 rota may not burr, may not uh, debulk the lesion because the calcification because it is eccentric. In such a situation, uh, would you require, would you uh, use an IVL? So uh, interesting that you asked me this question. Uh, uh, if you look at the, if you look at the data of IVL, areas where IVL does not work, uh, when you're talking about instant restenosis, there are a layer of metal of stent and there's calcium inside, it doesn't work. If the calcium is on the outside of the IVL, the IVL will work. That means if there is an unexpanded stent which has been placed in no, a calcium... I'm not referring to that stented patient. No, no, no. I understand what you're talking about. But when you're looking at... Cal so which are those areas where IVL does not work? One, a stent in which there is a calcium. And two, is a calcified nodule. In a calcified nodule, the calcium is on one side of the artery. There's a normal artery on the other side. For a synergy, for an impulse in energy to act, you need to have a wall which is equally hard on the other side. So you need to have opposing walls which are calcified for this technology to work. Therefore, this technology does not work in calcified nodules and nor does it work in single quadrant calcium, calcium which is very large. So if you had a 700 millimeter thick calcified sheet going only in one half of the artery, then most likely that you are not going to be able to crack it with IVL. And therefore, in those patients, I feel orbital atherectomy would be the, the device of choice because even the rotational atherectomy depends upon wire bias to touch those calciums. Okay, Kirti, I think Sridhar is ready yeah, with uh, his... Awesome. We'll go to Sridhar and then we'll come back. I'll go back. Okay. 
I think uh, this is a post dilatation with a 3 and C uh, lady. Uh, actually, I am always afraid to do the uh, female patient, small vessels, diffuse this thing. Mainly, the small diffuse vessels, they behave differently. And uh, mainly, slow flow, no flow, these are all very, very, complications are very, and the small caliber, small vessels, crossing also very difficult to, you know, like uh, overlapping zones also very tough to cross. Because bigger vessel, it's easy to cross. The smaller the vessel, more you put strength, more problem. Now, this is the post dilatation LED. We are doing with the 3mm bellwood dilatation. And this is, we are crossing the uh, studs. Uh, like, a, I know already we have crossed. Always I use filter XC to cross comfortable pilot or filter XC. Then go to the next. Next, This is, uh, uh, we are using 1.25mm Tazuna to dilate it. The studs are open with 1.25mm balloon. And don't push the balloon forcibly, only gradually just probe it and dilate it. Then go to the next. Next, this is a, a dilatation with a 2.5 balloon. Next. Now we are doing the uh, kissing balloon with 2.5 into the LCX, 3 mm into the LED, and this is the, uh, see, this is the final kissing. Uh, go to the next. This is the uh, next. It's again, uh, uh, higher uh, repeat dilatation because metal jacket is there, two overlaps layers are there. This high pressure inflation. Go to the next. Next. This is a final angle. Go to the next. Yeah, you can see the final angle. I think uh, next. Go to the next one view. Without. Yeah, this one. Great result. Okay. Now, this is uh, considering her disease severity, diffuse nature. I think uh, we can't, I can't ask more than this, I think. Uh, uh, so, Dr. Sridhar, I think your result is excellent. We yeah. had a lot of yeah. discussion about the ways of tackling this problem. Uh, but uh, can you show us the OCT? Have you done the OCT of this? No, yeah, I stopped OCT because further uh, contrast will be more diabetic patient. We have stopped doing the procedure. And now we have given already to CML, but our GFR is three. Uh, uh, almost uh, like a GFR is 95, she can tolerate well, but uh, now I don't want to put the OCT catheter and further damage this and stuff and everything. I think okay. we are extremely good results. I think, I think we accept leave. that. I think we uh, accept that. And uh, uh, do you have anything else to show us? Otherwise, I'll go to yeah, Dr. Nothing, sir. Everything is fine. You can uh, do it. Thank you all of you for uh, joining this meeting and uh, I really enjoyed uh, discussing with you. I learned a lot of things from input from Punamya, Kanolka, and Jabez. Really very great and pleasure to have all of you on this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kasturi. It was a fantastic final result. was extremely good result despite yeah, that bad yeah, result. Like, yeah, I think sometimes and that dissection, a dissection helped you to move from the V to a crush, a standard D or something like a, it's almost I a, think a crush. Dr. BT Shana, Dr. BT Shana. Is it Dr. Vitesh? That's Dr. Jabir. I'm Jabir. Dr. Jabir. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm uh, very, very happy with the result. But uh, sometimes we may think it's simple. But uh, as you know, it's everybody experience as the uh, time co uh, over the time course. We may think different studies. We may think like a simple. It may be converted to complex. But uh, even if the complication comes, uh, you should know how to handle it. How to tackle it, that's most important in French study. Thank you, Varad. Right, right. Great job, Dr. Sridhar. Yeah. Awesome. We go Thank ahead you. with Dr. Jabir. Yeah. With your presentation, please. I did. Yes, we can see your screen. Ah, yes, sir. So, uh, good evening. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I don't think there is something called the tips and tricks in uh, bifurcation and especially to this uh, audience who are so experienced in doing bifurcation for perhaps maybe for last 20 years, two decades or two and a half decades, you have been doing bifurcation and uh, what shall I tell you regarding bifurcation? Rather, I must uh, give an overview of what we are doing in bifurcation uh, uh, off late or rather uh, 
a general a general overview of the bifurcations rather than send some tip centric so this tech, this complex problem so uh, we have just seen dr sridhar kasturi uh, doing the case a one type of bifurcation stenting we did a problem arise and this was converted to another type of bifurcation uh, so this is a serious problem this problem is uh, every intervention is faced this problem because 20% of the lesions at least 20% one in five of the lesions we are tackling we have a bifurcation and at times or most of the times this can be complex and if you are lucky it can be simple so it's difficult complications are bound to occur so this is a uh, is a result that we may aim in a complex you can see the left main bifurcation and uh, this is two stent strategy a two stent strategy and uh, this two stent strategy resulted in an excellent uh, result with you can see there are no struts across the side branch of skim a well positioned strut well dilated strut well deployed strut with no malopposition but this is of course uh, Uh, the results we are all looking for, but even then, bifurcation sometimes give great disappointment. Despite all these visually excellent results, they may come back. So, what we require is not the tips and tricks. Rather, it is a perfect procedure and planning, understanding of the anatomy, the contingency plans. This was what the doctor Sridhar was also doing. There was a contingency plan because uh, always it can go berserk. A meticulous procedure. proper technique proper hardware and especially i believe it's a good team because they know what is this and uh, of course the patience of the operator if there is a problem with the patient of the patients of the operator if we lose patience uh, then we will go into trouble so the unwritten rules are careful evaluation of the angiogram background data the cardiac and renal function that is quite important dr uh, kanolkar was also telling about renal function is extremely important because we are going to use much more amount of contrast and if ct in addition more contrast the strategy whether it's a provisional or it's a two stent strategy then what is the technique which is the axis the hardware always discuss the plan with the team and we should have colleagues around that i think is uh, over the years what i found is that the most important thing is you should have colleagues with experience around who could help at times and never compromise on the preparation and planning never compromise on the hardware no oxford materials for a difficult bifurcation because after taking such a long time long procedure spending lot of energy and time with an oxford balloon you will end up in a shop problem and you will lose the entire results which you have been doing for last one or one and a half hours and the proper guide and access with a proper support a thoughtful approach and a good lesion preparation is critically important for the success and no two bifurcations are similar so the approach could be a provisional one the provisional approach is dictated by the side branch whether it is a true bifurcation or a non true bifurcation what is the size of the side branch extent and distribution of disease in the side branch and how important is the side branch that is the most important thing how important because sometimes it may be a 2 mm diagonal but it's a long diagonal of course as long as the lad which we cannot compromise and how much important this maybe only one diagonal supplying a large area maybe the size is only 2 or 2.25 in diameter but the length is 2 so nowadays the now the uh, consideration is for the length of the side branch also how important is the side branch for that patient for that specific anatomy and ankle from the main branch so the do's are the wiring in the main branch and this main vessel and the side branch proper lesion preparation look at the side branch angulation and the crossability that is important assessment of side branch angulation if it is an important side branch and if you are uh, you feel that if the crossability or a recross will be difficult always protect the side branch first with a, uh, a two stent strategy port and report so important final kissing balloon dilatation for two stent strategies this is extremely important and imaging of course now imaging has been found to be extremely useful in bifurcation and master one technique whether it is ivs or whether it is uh, oct but it is better for a person who is regularly doing bifurcation cases it is better to ma master both because at times we may not be able to use the oct there are limitations there are limits to the use of oct and we may have to resort to the uh, ivs and always if you have a trouble sacrifice the side branch and bail out the main branch so simple and easy technique is the crossover strategy or a side branch uh, if the side branch is small or clinically significant or side branch may be large but with a minimal disease to optimize lumen dimensions in the main branch or to keep the side branch open and you should have a 
physiologic flow in the side branch. Two stent strategy may be in uh, one third of the patient. Uh, a second stent may be required due to suboptimal result. A large side branch dissection, persistent intraprocedural angina, electrocardiographic changes, and a TME grade flow less than three, and a plaque shift with a more than 75% stenosis, or if you are doing an FFR, a significant FFR. To start with, a two stent strategy when they have when you have a large side branch more than 2.5 arm, a severe stenosis beyond the ostium of the side branch something to the tune of 10 or 20 millimeter and an unfavorable angle for recrossing after the main branch stenting. So small side branch diffusely vessel diffusely diseased vessel keep it open. If a large side branch with a large territory most of them may have to go with two stents. A focal osteal side branch disease, provisional stenting. A diffuse side branch disease, of course, two stents if you cannot compromise that side branch. And difficult to cross ankle or a side branch, axis may even be more challenging or even more impossible after the main branch ending. So go for the side branch first, then the main branch. So true bifurcation, some significant stenosis in the main branch and side branch. Yes, if the side branch is suitable for stenting, then if a side branch disease is diffuse or not localized to within 5 to 10 millimeter from the ostium, then you go for elective implantation of the two stents. If not, then it's provisional side branch. If it is a diffuse uh, side branch vessel, then keep it open, uh, stent on the main branch and keep it open for the side branch. So will you be able to rewire the side branch or main branch after the first stent in place? If it is no, it's a DK crush. If it is yes, if the ankulation is near right angle more than 70 degree, if the ankulation is more than 70 degree, it is tap or T. Nowadays, we don't do tap most of the time. I think all the senior operators also may prefer a tap rather than a T stent. But if the ankle is narrower than 70 degree, and if the size of the main and the side branch are similar and larger, then go for a culotte or sometimes a tap or a DK, but culotte is the preferred one. And if the size of the main branch and the side branch are similar and if they are dissimilar, then it is DK crush. So dissimilar side branch size and the narrow ankle, it is always DK crush. And if the side branches are similar of size, then it is Q-lot. And always, I prefer a seven French guiding catheter. It could be femoral or radial. If it is a radial, you can use a six, seven radial uh, guide catheter. If it is a reasonably big radial. Nowadays we started, uh, we are using 6-7 radial and large number of cases are done through the radial. Wire both the branches, dilate the main branch and the side branch if required. Stent main branch leaving a wire in the side branch. Rewire after performing a port and then remove the jailed wire. Kissing balloon inflation is very important to ensure optimal maintenance uh, stent morphology at the side branch ostium and stent side branch only if there's a suboptimal result. This uh, slide I've taken from one of the of older uh, uh, stocks of Antonio Colombio. Should I wire the side branch? Yes, because you are not going to lose anything by wiring a side branch. But at the same time, it may keep the vessel open. It may give an idea for guide for the uh, recrochure uh, re of the side branch if required. And should I implant one or two stents? One stent most of the times, two stents if you are afraid to lose the side branch. And if the side branch is large and disease extending, your confident and your confidence with a two stents technique. And bifurcation staining, the sizing the main branch stand is based on the proximal brain branch can result in a carinal shift. So always the main branch stent is sized on the distal main branch, which results about the transmission of doctor to get it rectified. Yeah, I don't think Kirti Punamia is there. He must have left. I'm not too sure, sure about it. Oh, yeah, there. Uh, can you unmute yourself? I can. Sure. OK. Uh, one or two questions by the time they sort out the issue. Yeah. Now, when you are doing a bifurcation stenting, mm -hmm. let, let us not uh, look at left main uh, bifur distal bifurcation. I'm looking at LED diagonal bifurcation. You have completed the procedure from imaging point of view. Would you be happy only performing a LED imaging or you would also like to perform a diagonal to LED imaging? Sir, sure. sure. if I put two stents in an artery, then I need to have 
two image runs in that artery, one from each branch. If I do not use two stents, then there is no point in doing that. Now, sometimes if a side branch, now particularly, and particularly mark you this, it is more common with the circumflex artery. Sometimes when you go into the circumflex and you go kind of distal, the bends that are there in the circumflex may not allow you to do a very good imaging in that OM branch because in trying to do a final imaging of that OM branch, an operator should realize that he should not push the catheter and then deform a lesion because even pushing that OCT catheter sometimes can deform certain uh, stent struts. So if it can be done easily, fine. But if it cannot be done easily, especially when you're going into the circumflex and when you're going into a branch, if it doesn't want to go, that's fine. But before you were, before you, when you implanted that stent, before you went to your second stent, it is reasonable to do an imaging and make sure that you've deployed that stent very optimally and corrected it before your second stent comes in. I think that is a key that I have learned that there were almost around 20% of side branches. The second, the final run of OCT or IVUS is not possible in a bifurcation lesion. Yes. So to summarize that, I have, we would uh, aim at uh, 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 interrogating from both the, both the vessels, both the stents. And however, if the angulation is interfering with the uh, passage of the catheter, that is the uh, OCD wire or the IVUS wire, mm. then I would leave it alone. However, mm. don't destroy something that is already good. Yeah, that's important. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, yeah, Jabir is there. Sorry, 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 there was an error. So Jabir, this is sorry. a problem that is just like a complex bifurcation. This is a complex type of presentation that sometimes it happens. But you bailed yourself. Yes. Out, right? The side branch is uh, long. You can see your slides, but your audio is not clear. All right. So the position of the standing bifurcation. No, I think uh, Jabir, you are not audible. Somebody from the organizer, can you come online? Anybody from the organizer is there? Yes, sir. Yeah, who is this? Uh, I'm Shanjeevi, sir. Okay, sure. we are having problem with uh, Dr. Jabir. Otherwise, okay. we are almost through with the discussion. What do you suggest we should do? Uh, your call, sir. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm right. right. You can see. Uh, can, can you hear me now? No, sir. I can see a slide, but your audio is bad. We can't understand what you're talking. I think the internet connection might be the issue with him. Uday, we've lost ourselves as well, or we've just lost. No, no, I'm here. Oh, okay. Uh, it is already past eight o'clock, and the participants are also started reducing now. I think. Uh, uh, can you hear now? Yeah, I can hear you now. All right, all right. Uh, we'll quickly finish it. So, uh, yeah. six to eight millimeter from the proximal standards to the bifurcation. So this is a patient uh, uh, in which we did the left main bifurcation and you can see the OCT showing the struts across it. It's a provisional standing, the struts across the circumflex ostium. And that's where uh, the proper crossing, it was a mid strut uh, 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 a crossing and a final uh, kissing balloon. And this is important to the kissing balloon. After the kissing balloon, you can see the entire struts has been removed have been removed. So it is the circumflex ostium is strut free. So this is a trifurcation. This is something similar to what Dr. Kirti was also showing. What type of stenting you will do here? Is it, uh, uh, should we send uh, uh, for a surgery or we can uh, do something? We did an OCT and OCT helps us to uh, uh, tell that you can go ahead with a single stent strategy, a crossover stenting from the left main to the LED across the ramus and the circumflex. 
you can see because what you can see after stenting because we found that the ram osteum was free of disease the circumflex osteum was free of disease and the circumflex and lad there was a wide gap but the ramus the, the, the ankle was quite narrow nothing happened to the ramus nothing happened to the circumflex and in the oct you can see both the uh, side branches are or side branch osteo are well open without any issue so it's a widely open circumflex no struts across widely open uh, uh, ramus also so these are situations where you it is help so the t and the protrusion the exact positioning of the stents i'll go to that thing and also the importance of a port technique which the theoretical benefit you know the distal strut deformations enlargement and facilitate the optimized side branch axis and kissing and uh, you can see uh, the post dilatation with a port with a 3.5 nc it corrects the under expansion it facilitates the recrossing distal recrossing kissing inflations and osteal stent coverage so the balloon size according to the digital def reference short balloons and non compliant balloons side branch first and then simultaneous at least 30 seconds port may be used in case of a large side branch and final single balloon report we don't have a randomized data and the tap steps i think there is no need to uh, so this is the stent protruding into the main vessel the minimal stent protrusion that you have to ensure the minimal stent protrusion where you can use this uh, technologies uh, uh, the, the, uh, these technologies can be used where you can go for a stent boost and see that thing and the wire crossing is important there has to be the distal or the mid wire crossing that is quite important uh, for a two, uh, for a proper kissing balloon dilatation and a better result here imaging can help you and it can tell you whether the wire is in the distal strut where is wire is in the middle strut or the wire is in the proximal strut and if an error occurs in the tap like side branch stent too distant repeat the tap if it is too proximal that is something like an unacceptable protrusion a balloon crash and side branch too proximal extreme protrusion in a port and then convert into a culotte the dk crash we know the steps of the dk crush these are the steps of the dk crush the side branch is crushed by a main main uh, vessel balloon use a good balloon a, a, a high pressure balloon or a non compliant balloon then rewire and case and uh, then deploy the main branch and rewire the side branch high pressure dilatation with a nc balloon and final kissing balloon inflation and say this the first stent is deployed the first crash then the rewiring get these things fill out and during each proper uh, 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 crushing and then uh, 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 kissing and uh, the introduction of the wire this is the usual create problem so always use neoc wire always use neoc balloons and uh, this is the patient which uh, you can see properly this is the distal wire cross in this and uh, distal wire cross and following the final kissing balloon entire struts have been removed from the ostium and a good carina that is formed and for a culotte also the technique i don't think uh, any discussion for the steps of this thing but rewiring for a final kissing balloon is advancements of the second strut is through the metal strut that is uh, uh, very uh, that is the area where it can give a hinge and an optimized stent expansion in both the branches is the uh, uh, your, it's a great advantage of the culotte technique but always a high metal concentrate is the bifurcation which can mean lead to an inadequate stent expansion so this you can see uh, okay we went ahead with the culotte technique this is the difficulty in the culotte just like in crush the rewiring but once the rewiring does then everything is a cake walk and this is the final result of this uh, culotte you can see again uh, the oct which is showing the mid cross of the stent strut followed by the final kissing balloon and the circumflex ostium is free of the struts the carina is well formed so my closing thoughts are no two bifurcations are seen select the appropriate strategy that is based on the operator's experience it, there are no definite tips and tricks always follow the correct steps step 1 2 3 4 
and plan well in advance, it saves time and minimizes the complications. So no trips, uh, uh, no tricks, no tips. It is only a meticulous planning and a proper uh, uh, stepwise, uh, uh, a stepwise implementation of the bifurcation standing procedure. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Jabir. Excellent presentation. Of course, technology always creates a problem in between. But uh, it was an excellent presentation as far as the bifurcation technique is concerned. And to add it to that, we have did OCT pictures demonstrating the uh, final result in bifurcation technique. There are no questions on the chat box over there. Uh, so may I ask Dr. Kirti Punamia to for his comments and to conclude the session? Uh, no, I think uh, Dr. Javir, that talk was absolutely fantastic. The points you made were fantastic. Uh, I think this entire session has been good. Uday, you've uh, done a remarkable job in getting out the very salient features about a lot of aspects of uh, this complex uh, bifurcation situation. And uh, I think uh, I think this evening has been a very well spent evening. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Jabbir. Thank you, Dr. Kirti Pramia, Dr. Sridhar, and the organizers uh, of this uh, meeting. Uh, can we go offline, please? Uh, before that, let us thank you on all the people who have participated. Let us thank Dr. Uday Kanokar for his fantastic uh, 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 what do you call the moderate, uh, moderating this session. It was excellent, uh, and we learned a lot. And uh, we learned a lot. Also, we learned uh, how to moderate a session perfectly well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have Bye. a nice drink. Oh, <laughs> a virtual drink or a true one? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye. Good night. Bye. Take care. Thank you.